He tried to do his best as circumstances confronted him. At, at different stages, he made different personal decisions. It has been recorded that he, he himself has spoken so much about it, how timid he was as a boy. At some point, decides that he is going to conquer his fear, that he will not be governed by fear. And then at another point in his life, he is treated horribly by this chief British officer in his part of Gujarat. So Gandhi had to deal with another emotion, closely allied to fear, the emotion of hatred. So it is his decision to confront the situation where he finds himself. And if he's blocked by fear, if he's blocked by hate, he's going to fight those. Welcome to Intersections. Our path is to dissolve boundaries, to find ways to build unity across what appears to be at times disparate perspectives, communities, and ideas. In order to help us explore our full potential, both as individuals and as humanity at large. Today, we have the beautiful and distinctive honor to have in our midst the grandson of one of the most inspiring luminaries who has informed the work that I do at Columbia and at our Mentora Institute, Mahatma Gandhi. So we have in our midst Professor Rajmohan Gandhi, who has on his paternal side, Mahatma Gandhi as his grandfather, and on his maternal side, Chakravarti Rajagopalachari, who was the last governor general of India as his grandfather as well. Dr. Rajmohan Gandhi is an international renowned peace activist, an acclaimed historian, biographer, journalist, and educator. She serves as the research professor at the College of Education at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And through his range of writing and speaking, public interventions, and dialogues, he has been engaged for 60 years in efforts for peace building, reconciliation, and the pursuit of democratic rights in the world. He has founded the Indian branch of Initiatives for Change. He is a distinguished journalist, founded the weekly journal Himad, through which he fought for democratic rights during the 1975-77 emergency in India. He has also served in the upper house of the Indian parliament as an award-winning author. He has written more than a dozen books, including Mohandas, A True Story of a Man, his people and an empire, and Rajaji, a life and biography of Chakravarti Rajagopalachari. It is such a joy and privilege to have in our midst, Rajmohanji. Thank you for joining us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, uh, Dr. Vadva. It's just a delight, and I look forward to our conversation. This is the moment I've much been looking forward to. You know, you, you're not just merely someone who's you know, having in your bloodstream these incredible luminaries, you know, like like your paternal and maternal grandfathers, but but you've also been living these truths and packaging and offering them in your own very, very thoughtful way for consumption and practice in modern times. And and so as we have this conversation over the next hour, I'd love to unpack both your ideas, memories, learnings, you know, from, for example, Mahatma Gandhi, but also much of what you've been manifesting in your own life. So I have with me open a chapter that um, I wrote in my book, Inner Mastery, Outer Impact, which just got published last year. And it was probably the hardest chapter I had to write in the book. And it was a chapter in which I was using Mahatma Gandhi as a as the vehicle, you know, through which to express how leadership, you know, on the outside, in the messy, messy world, can emerge from a very, very subtle and ineffable place within us, you know, which is our soul. So I call it uh, leading with self-realization. I'd written other chapters on Abraham Lincoln and Ellen Roosevelt and, you know, Mother Teresa and Nelson Mandela about leading with purpose and love and wisdom and, and growth. But this one, in some ways, was the hardest because the idea that there is material impact you can have in the world in a messy, political, you know, power-hungry, etc. context, from that place of incredible purity and peace within you know, how can one make an argument for that? And of course, Gandhiji became my default leader to go to for that. And so uh, I'd love for you to unpack a little bit of that mystique and magic of how he was able to connect the dots between that unity of spirit within and the 
messiness and differentiation of life without. And, and I, I thought maybe, Raj Manji, if you're open to it, we could start with just um, having me ask you, when you look back you know, to your interactions with him in those early years of your life, what is your fondest memory of him? My fondest memory of him is his hug, his, uh, his warmth. When I was going from 10 to 12, when he was going from 76 to 78, shortly before he was killed, he was often in Delhi, which is where I was raised, where my father was a journalist. He was editing the Hindustan Times. So that was the period when I saw a lot of my grandfather. He was he and I were in the same city, of course, not living in the same place, uh, but I saw a lot of him. So his warmth was particularly remembered by me because my meetings with him were relatively short. I didn't have long one-on-one sessions with him because that was a time when India was becoming independent, India was being partitioned, there were refugees in Delhi and Hindus from West Pakistan. The Muslims of Delhi were feeling very uneasy because they felt they were being pushed out of Delhi. People of all kinds were surrounding my grandfather. So my siblings and I had to, might say, fight for our time with him. But when, whenever he saw my siblings or me, the affection with which he greeted me. So in terms of the fondest memory, that was the, that is what I remember. But there are other things to remember from the time, which I can speak of if you ask about. Of course, I, I want to give you free reign to share uh, any of these yeah, very precious impressions you have of him. One, one question that has intrigued me a lot over the years is how he really, for the most part, didn't gravitate towards holding official positions of power and authority. And yet he held so much sway over so many people, both across the masses as well as in you know, positions of great power and influence, both on the India side and ultimately even over the British. And so you know, that's one thing I'd, I'd love for you to weigh in on, which is what was the source of his mystique, his, his capacity to... Yeah, just uh, have people listen to him and uh, ultimately follow him. So from my, you know, I did spend this time with him when I was between 10 and 12. But then I've also done a fair amount of study of his life. And I've met numerous people who knew him over a longer period. I've read what critics and adversaries of his, opponents of his have written about him. Journalists who interviewed him, many others. So wh- one thing that uh, occurs, occurs to me or is that I don't think that at any stage he said, how can I make an impact on this world? He tried to do his best as circumstances confronted him. And the result was that he made an impact. So it isn't as if at some point early in his life he said, okay, here I am. How am I going to make an impact on the world? I want to have a career of making an impact on the world. That is not how I come across Gandhi's progress in life. But I think at some stage, or at different stages, he made different personal decisions. It has been recorded that he himself has spoken so much about it, how timid he was as a boy. He would Mm -hmm. stammer, he couldn't speak. And, you know, in those days, People were married quite young, and his wife, Kastur, Kastur Bai, as we called him, called her, was much braver than him. He was very embarrassed when he found that he was timid. He was afraid of the dark. He was afraid of serpents. He was afraid of thieves. But here was this young woman, and she was fearless. This timid fellow at some point decides that he is going to conquer his fear, that he will not be governed by fear. And then at another point in his life, he is treated horribly by this chief British officer in his part of Gujarat, a man called Olivant. And horribly, now Gandhi is, is born in a prestigious family. His father was a kind of a minister, a prime minister of Pocket, princely Pocket in Western India. Family was of great dignity. They weren't rich, very great honor. So when he was so roughly treated so, by this man Olivant, So Gandhi had to deal with another emotion, closely allied to fear, the emotion of hatred. He seems to have said, no, no, I'm going to conquer this as well. 
So it is his decision to confront the situations where he finds himself. And if he's blocked by fear, if he's blocked by hate, he's going to fight those. So it is by responding, uh, the phrase you used uh, earlier on about the soul, you know, the innermost. So Gandhi also had this eagerness to return to his soul for a response that he should make. I will fight fear. I will fight hate. And there are other instances like that. So this is how one way in which I could describe. And the, the result of his doing this was the impact. Return to his soul. Wow, that's such a, yeah, just a powerful and beautiful idea. And so is this growth that we have observed in Gandhiji over the years that you and other historians have recorded primarily happening in his teens and 20s and 30s? Or is it something that we see across the whole arc of his life? In other words, at the time when he, at some level, perhaps became a lot more clarified about his core motivations, his core purpose, his desire to want to serve the underprivileged in India, to strive for Hindu-Muslim unity, to really fight against um, imperial rule in India, etc. Um, in his later years, as some of those ideals got very solidified in him, from there on, was he essentially always in that state? Or do you find evidence that he was still, in some ways, returning to the soul and from time to time needing to readjust you know, his uh, instincts or his behaviors? Because it'll be kind of interesting for, for those of us who, <laughs> even in our mature years, you know, find that we are far from, you know, far from being, you know, anywhere close to perfect, right? To, to understand what Gandhi's journey was like in his 60s and, and, and 70s. Oh, he, I think he was the first to say that he was ne never perfect. He was always conscious of his imperfections. He was a human being with all the flaws that all human beings have. But I'll just make a couple of comments on what you've said. First of all, Hindu-Muslim unity, fighting for the rights of the untouchables, fighting British imperialism, all these were very early passions in his life, very deep passions and early passions. And they remained uh, his passions throughout his life. But he was having to deal with great challenges, great difficulties. You know, some of these goals of his in the Muslim unity, fighting untouchability, fighting for India's freedom, there was some tension between these goals because he needed the support of the high castes, the so-called high castes. They were keen on Indian independence. They were not keen on fighting untouchability. And some of them were not keen on Hindu-Muslim unity. Some of them were, some of them were not. And uh, uh, many Muslims were, were happy with the idea of Hindu-Muslim partnership, but they had reservations about other things. So, so he had, in order to fight these goals, which at times had tension between them, he again needed to return to his soul, not so much to his mind for uh, wisdom, although that too, he, he was a shrewd man. He felt that the human mind was also given by the Almighty to be used. He was a very astute man in his dealings. But when it came to, to these very big tensions, which had great consequences also in his family life, there were threats to his life. So his existence was uh, at stake again and again. His uh, progress uh, was uh, impeded again and again. So, yes, he was returning to his soul all the time, every day, all his life. Uh, maybe he could have done a better job of it. He himself feels that he could have done a better job of it at uh, different stages. I might also add that he had these very great goals early on in life, but these great goals didn't encompass everything in the world. For instance, when he was in Africa for 21 years or so, he that is where he found this idea of nonviolent resistance, satyagraha, great changes in his life. But the raising the African people to great levels of justice and dignity was not the passion of his life in South Africa. It was the Indian community in South Africa, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Parsis, the Sikhs, but not the Africans. So it isn't as if 
early on in his life, uh, he embraced all of humanity as his concern. Maybe he should have. Not very, not many people did that. Certainly, he did not. Anyway, those are some some remarks that you know, Mr. Gandhi. On on that very note, um, as I was doing the research for my book, and obviously, I only have a very small sliver of understanding relative to your much deeper, broader uh, study. The findings that uh, I was emerging with is that in the years ahead, he ended up really expanding that intrigue, aspiration, attunement to all of humanity. And ultimately, while his focus was India, perhaps he was always encouraging and nurturing movements you know, in other parts of the world. I don't know if you've heard this quote, but um, apparently when Nelson Mandela came to India, you know, he, he talked even just about the transformation he went through during his time in South Africa for, because that was a significant period of time, right? You said, what was it, 21 years? 21, out of which about two were set, spent in India. So actual months were months of 19 years, yeah. 19 years, yeah, yeah, 19 years. So he went there as an adult. He came out probably somewhere in his 40s then, when he yeah, came 40, back to India. 44, yeah. 45, yeah. 44, 45, yeah. So Mandela said, he said, you know, and as he was in India and he was drawing the connection between the two lands, he said, you gave us Mohandas and we gave you back the Mahatma. Yes, he did say that. He did say that. By the way, I had the chance to meet uh, Mandela on that visit to, to India that he made, then a member of parliament. But that's another story. But uh, you're quite right that, and incidentally, on his South African time, there is one very remarkable talk he gave in the year 1908. And this was published at the time in the newspapers of Johannesburg. And this is an unusual statement that he makes, where he envisions a future where the Africans, the Chinese, the Indians, the Asians, the Europeans, all form together, commingle together to form a new humanity. In fact, I have not come, although I have pointed out the limitation in Gandhi's time in South Africa that he was, he was largely confined to the Indians of South Africa and their rights. But he did articulate in 1908 an incredible future vision of a commingled humanity of all the races. Right. This is the point that you were making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How beautiful, how beautiful. Actually, that would be a speech worth uh, studying. It's easy, easily accessible. On the point you make about how he focused only on the Indians, the one, I guess, mitigating logic there that I can offer from, you know, and I want to test with you, from my study of, you know, great change makers over the course of history is that I find with pretty much all of them, they had a realization that time was, in a sense, the enemy. They only had so much of time, and whether it was going to be measured in days or decades, and therefore, they were very disciplined about focusing their energies and time on a cause, a cause that they were seeking to dedicate their life towards. And the more noble the change maker, the more, as in that Gandhian speech you mentioned, drawn they were to ultimately making sure that everything they did would be net additive to humanity not something that would just be net additive to their people and subtractive from the rest of humanity. But they did have to ultimately stay very disciplined not to allow themselves to get swept up with every cause, swept up with every issue that society was, you know, finding surging at some point or the other to stay disciplined, you know, towards a certain end game for, a, I guess, a certain part of humanity towards a certain future that they wanted to create. For Mother Teresa, it was not mental health, it was, you know, the dying, the destitute, the diseased, you know, for, for Mandela, it was not all of Africa, it was South Africa and apartheid and, you know, and so on. So anyway, I just want to kind of test that thesis with you that maybe that's just something we're all meant to be, yeah, respecting is that with the limitations of space and time, however great our heart might be, ultimately, you know, it'll, it'll need focus. I think that's a very, very fine way of understanding all human beings, great people, small people, all of us, mm -hmm. that our aims are very large or quite small. We have to have a limited focus. It's essential if you have to achieve anything solid in one area. And it's impossible for a human being, no matter how, how gigantic her or his heart may be, to embrace every 
crucial cause in the world at the same time. It's just out of the question. Yeah. And your point about being a net additive is a very good one too. I like that phrase. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that resonates. So he's going through his life. He's taking on these causes. He wants to return to his soul on a, on a regular basis. You know, anecdotally, one hears about him having a disciplined practice of prayer. Was that sort of his way of creating a daily pathway back to his soul or anything that really strikes you about what's a practical prescription we can give our listeners on how they can kind of pursue that same discipline? So it's more a commitment than a technique. As I understand his life, it was he, uh, his commitment to these great goals that I had mentioned, but also to his soul, that he was, he was not going to disobey his conscience. So this was a fundamental resolution made early on in life and repeatedly made and renewed several times in his life. So that he is not going to disobey his conscience was the commitment. Now, the, to implement that commitment, yes, he prayed. He took moments of silence. But, you know, he also often used to say, you know, because when there were times when some people were not happy with his, especially with his idea of Hindu-Muslim unity, that India belonged to everybody. And so when violence occurred in 47, and many Hindus and Sikhs suffered, of course, many Muslims also suffered. But the many Hindus and Sikhs who suffered, since Gandhi was a very devout Hindu, they were very unhappy with his attempt to take on sufferings of everybody. Mm -hmm. So they were urging him, you say you are a religious man, a spiritual seeker, you go to the Himalayas, go to the cave, caves. Don't bother with all of us, these worldly pursuits. And you want to go to the soul, then go to the Himalayas. So Gandhi's answer was, I carry my Himalayas with me wherever I go. 1947 48 he was assassinated in 1948 and so this was you know in the very very last chapter of his life that all this strife occurred in india and it's uh you know it's close to my heart personally because um you know my father and mother were caught you know caught in that fray as well and had to immigrate from what ultimately became pakistan and uh saw some of that bloodshed you know that happened uh, at that time but it's really powerful to recognize in what you're saying that here was a man who'd given his everything, you know, to the service of society and had in some ways achieved such an incredible end with the, um, you know, the ultimate peaceful transition of power from the British. Uh, peaceful until we have the partition riots that, you know, that happened, but still being so vociferously criticized and um, dealt with skeptically. By, by so many, as, as what you've said, you know. So we have this naive view at times of um, the arc of a great life, you know, that perhaps you were misunderstood at some point and you were human at some point, but then you grow and develop and the world starts to follow you and then you become this shining light that just carries the world to some beautiful end and then you gracefully pass on. But it was actually quite messy until, until you know, and of course he got assassinated, which, which is a whole different, you know, story unto itself in his very last moments. But um, the idea that even amongst the Hindus, you know, there was uh, a huge amount of just unhappiness with some of the choices he was making at that time is it's very sobering for any of us trying to use popularity as a metric for you know success. But uh, popularity, of course, is a very very unsatisfactory metric for success. Uh, but but it's nonetheless it's very important to recognize that despite the violence that took place and despite the unhappiness that many Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims, all it isn't as if the unhappiness was only felt on the Hindu and Sikh side. Yeah. Incidentally, you know, one of uh, my more recent books is a very detailed study of Punjab, of the partition and the killings of the Hindus and Sikhs and the Muslims in Punjab, and the whole history, not just the immediate prior history of partition, but 240 years of Punjab's history. And you find evidence of how Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims in different parts of Punjab all, all suffered very greatly. You know, the point I'm making is that Gandhi's life actually was an enormous success in the sense that for 40, 50 years after partition, Indians wholeheartedly, as a people, as a nation, as a state, as parliament, as intellectuals, accepted the idea that India belongs to everybody. 
And yes, uh, some Hindus or many Hindus at different stages were unhappy with some of Gandhi's passions. His passion that Muslims should have equal rights in India. His passion against untouchability also was not popular. He had assassination attempts on him in the 30s on the untouchability question, uh, much before a successful attempt to, uh, to kill him. Uh, but I, I think it's important when we think of effectiveness, popularity, success, these are all very not so unambiguous words, but nonetheless, they, they are often meaningful words. The fact that for such a long time, there was considerable, if not unanimity, cons overwhelming consensus in India in favor of India being a secular state. Today, it isn't. Today, there is another. But I think that 50 years is, a, is an enormously long period. So uh, I would not understate the effectiveness of what Gandhi's life achieved. Yeah, I, I really like the challenge you posed to my sort of more pessimistic view about how he must have felt, you know, pained at the criticism some of his core positions were receiving at that time. But that was a very heightened moment of emotionalism in India, of course, you know, as well, 1947-48. But let's just continue down the path you've just uh, opened opened us up for. One of the things that I've sometimes observed is how when you look at the developing world, you know, what they called in the past, they used to call it the third world, those countries that got their independence, you know, after, what is it, the Second World War? You know, the end of World War II, yeah. Yeah, end of World War II, right? I mean, there are very few nations that have been able to really have democracy take take root in them uh, where there is a non-violent transfer of power you know every few years based on the people's voice and uh, and india as a highly complex nation a highly diverse nation a you know highly populated nation for it to have had as you've said you know the capacity to roughly speaking despite that very painful uh, period of partition riots for the most part transition gracefully into democratic rule is, to me, an incredible, to your point, incredible testament to what he had prepared the Indian psyche for, perhaps for decades, you know, going, going. I think it's, it's a very important point you make. And it wasn't a minor thing at all. And in the early years of India's independence, before Gandhi was killed and shortly after he was killed, many uh, critics or many analysts of the world said this, there was no way in which this unwieldy democracy with so many languages, so many religions, so many castes could possibly survive as a democracy. And it has survived as a democracy, not just by ho holding re elections every five years, but also through an independent media, through an independent judiciary, through an independent active civil society, through uh, vigorous uh, debates. So this has been a very, very, as you, as you pointed out, very few countries, there were one, or two, one or two small countries that can claim that kind of record. But India's is a unique example of an enormously large country, now of course the world's most populous country. Diversity that can't be equaled. And yet, it has been a vigorous. But here I must point out that in recent years, this proud record is now in very great danger. And there is a very strong opinion in India that equality, democracy, those are things for weak people. Strong people should have supremacy. Legitimate uh, citizens of a, of a country, quote unquote, legitimate citizens of a country. They should have supremacy. And so this is, I have to point this out, uh, is, a, is a very deeply concerning development today. Now, I'm aware, uh, Raj Munji, that this is something that you have been, uh, you know, seeking to actively lend a voice to and uh, have been quite, um, yeah, just active in sharing your concerns from time to time about what you see as uh, as the developments there. And, you know, I go to India fairly regularly over the years. Of course, we all took a pause in the COVID years. Um, but um, I notice um, certain things that one can feel energized by and certain other things as you're saying that on the fringe one feels troubled by i'm curious about sort of your your views on some of those developments you know across across the board right when you think about it in sort of with a you know with a fully sort of um just 
outside-in lens, since you and I, we both have the luxury of both yeah. being, being in the system, but also out of the system, you know, yeah. living in the United States. One of the things I noticed, for example, is just the greater sense of buoyancy and optimism. You know, I see in India relative to what I see in the US right now around the frayed social fabric and the questioning of sort of where is capitalism taking us. There, it appears that some of the grassroots level development that is happening around financial systems and infrastructure and all that, you know, seem anyway, I mean, when I have some of those conversations, I find that people are feeling quite invested in the building of a, you know, building of a nation, so to say. And yet, to your point, I mean, there are some of these um, social and religious tension points, you know, that have arisen that, um, you know, that I know are causing grave concern, you know, to many. There's no doubt that there is in many areas of Indian life, the economy, a lot of vibrancy. Many people are optimistic. Uh, millions of people, and this is not just the last 10 years or so, the last 35 or so, 40 years, there's been right. steady economic progress, which has continued uh, in recent years also. So there is undoubtedly great optimism among many, many, many very capable people. Another thing, by the way, that has happened is that the Indian people have increasingly, increasingly reminded themselves that the whole world is their home. Not just India is their home, but the whole world is, is their home, which is, can be witnessed now in many parts of the world. But along with this sense of optimism and vibrancy in large and significant and gifted sections of the Indian population, very large sections of the Indian population are feeling terribly, terribly frightened. So this is a, a cause for very deep concern. After all, you know, the Christians are about 2 to 2.5%. The Sikhs are about 2%, 2.5%. Muslims are about 14 to 15% of the Indian population. But when you realize that India's population will soon be 1.5 billion, these two or three percentages or 14 or 15 percentages uh, really describe scores and hundreds of millions of people. And if hundreds of millions of people feel that they can't say what they want to say, then it is a very, very sad state of affairs. So both things are there. There is very great vibrancy among large sections of people and very deep unhappiness. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it seems to me to be the perfect arena in which to experiment and explore some of Gandhiji's methods. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And you yourself, right, have been pioneering many practices like this, you know, over the last 60 years. Uh, so can we transition into a little bit of your journey? Yes. You know, how did you make the choices in your life to go down a certain path? And um, what are perhaps certain practices or insights, certain, you know, breakthroughs that in other periods of time in India and or in other cultures where at a time when perhaps the cultural, social, religious, national, like fabric might be frayed in some ways, where you have found perhaps the, the use of certain practices to be able to bring people together, to quell like impassioned, you know, feelings and, um, and create breakthroughs, you know, to help humanity move forward in a more united way. Okay. So I'll mention first a few insights that I have acquired over time. Then I'll mention a few practices. So some insights. This applies uh, to, to India, but perhaps applies to the world as a whole. One thing that, one weakness that I find in large or, or in important sections of India's society and politics is as follows. Many people band together for some good cause and sometimes succeed, but very quickly logic turns into something like this. Forget your foes, finish your friends. So good people are not able to stick together for a long time. Forget your foes, finish your friends is a very strong tendency. So this is one insight. And so I'm sorry, before we move on, uh, yeah. Mr. Gandhi, so by that you mean that they tend to devolve into a lot of infighting and egos yes. and yeah? Yes. Ego clashes. So, you know, there have been many last 30, 40 years, times democratic 
people wanting to conserve democracy from different backgrounds have come together, but they haven't been able to stick together over a long period of time. Ego clashes have brought governments down and, and so forth. So, so forget your foes, finish your friends seems to be a, a weakness historically and in recent years. Then another general insight I would make, which is a very obvious one, for many of us in India, no matter what our background may be, whatever religion caste it may be, we have opinions about other groups, but we don't have knowledge about other groups. We have opinions. We don't know our neighbors. We don't listen to people who are different from us, say by caste or by religion or whatever language. We don't read what they write. We don't befriend them. Our circles don't intersect. But although we have no knowledge, we have very firm and sharp opinions. So this is something to recognize. You know, on this one, um, I'm noticing it more and more that um, we, as the people, rush to judgment very quickly on the basis of small yeah. little provocations. Uh, you know, recently there was this moment with the Dalai Lama, you know, as an example. And every now and then something is being floated or shared in social media. And almost immediately there's a mob-like <laughs> sort of rush to judgment, oh, yeah. uh, you know, without real pause, uh, you know, uh, deepening and probing and exploring and ideating. And people seem to have almost lost the capacity to say, let me create for a little bit of time a space, a space for discovery and exploration where even though I have a hypothesis, I'll put it aside for a minute just so that I can listen to contrarian points of view and, you know, get, get more of a collective understanding. I think that's a crucial point. Uh, reading, researching, discernment. We don't practice these uh, arts uh, or these uh, activities. And we do rush to judgment. Uh, we don't reflect. We don't research. So this is, of course, one result of the pace of our, of our lives these days. But uh, this is absolutely true. Uh, reading reflecting, discernment. Well, uh, so the practices, maybe I'll reflection. So I, maybe I'll just tell a couple of stories about my own life that may be of some interest. Which may Wonderful. Be. Let's do that. So early on, you know, I had a neighbor uh, my age in, in New Delhi. We were about the same age. We had same interests. We were very good friends. But he was a very good cricketer and I was not. And he was good at batting and bowling, and and I was very envious of him. And occasionally, when he did not do so well in a particular day, I would go to his apartment, which is literally next door to ours, and say to him, Aruna, aaj kya hua? what happened today? And rub in the fact that he hadn't done so well, which was, of course, a horribly mean thing to do. And then when I, a friend pointed something to me, that appreciation not comparison can be one way to lead your life. Appreciation, not comparison. So this little tip helped me a lot. And of course, I was able to be frank with my friend, tell him that I had these silly and petty thoughts. Of course, he was more than generous and our friendship ripened and his children and our children. Uh, so uh, continued that. But that simple idea of appreciating, not comparing, has helped me a lot, not only in personal relationships, but in, in other kind of ways of understanding what's happening in the world. And one or two other little examples that I'll mention. That itself, by the way, Mr. Gandhi, is really powerful. I just want to pause there for a minute. So I think if I hear you, what you're saying is, hey, listen, yeah. folks, get away from the instinct. And I think in some ways it's very socially conditioned, isn't it? Or trying to put everybody on some kind of a, you know, comparison ladder where some people are higher than other people and yeah. whatever dimension of life it is that you're looking at. Yeah. Just, yeah. just get away from that. Just get away from that and don't seek to think about inferiority and superiority and all of that. And instead, just look at the world through that lens of appreciation, right? And keep admiring and appreciating the qualities that you see in people around you and almost feel like uplifted by that, inspired by that. Is kind of exactly what I'm hearing. That's exactly what I mean. And you put it in better words than I have. Uh, it also then means that you are taking yourself out of the picture too. You know, me or mine is not there. 
because the comparison often yeah. brings you know you or, or people like you or people you belong to your yeah. type your group your nation whatever whatever yeah but yes put that aside appreciate so yeah. that, that that has helped me again and again uh, and continues to help me because it's something i have to remind myself of uh, of all the times so i i i i'm glad that seemed to mean something to you something else that happened to me when i was quite young i was in scotland trying to learn something about journalism i was training with a newspaper there i was about 21 uh, at the time and i went to a store to get a christmas or a new year card to send to my family it was a i'm talking of 1956 a long time ago it was a very crowded store everybody was collecting cards for the year end and i found that a child grabbed my hand because this child uh, had got separated from her parents and she just grabbed i was 21 this young white scottish girl of about 3 maybe 3 4 you know trusted me so completely and implicitly that to me was a reminder that really humanity was one the white race the black race the brown race the colonized the colonizers it made no difference she was a child she was looking for some looking for her dad or mother or uncle or whatever she found me and she grabbed my hand and that that was a tiny thing that has also reminded me that early on that yes i feel for india very deeply i continue to but really all the races of the world all the nations of the world we are on together yeah that reminds me of this quote from um, mandela about you know none of us uh, are born knowing how to like hate somebody on the basis of you know race religion gender or something we have to learn how to hate you know and if we can learn how to hate then we can le- you know we can also learn how to love you know <laughs> love comes more naturally to the human yeah. human yeah. condition yeah. Yeah. so something like that but I I love how you're going to what me seem to be inconsequential moments in a life but actually in imbue them with so much meaning and such lasting growth and impact for yourself. Uh, let me tell you give you one more little story again from my younger days. They were in my college in Delhi ages ago. There were two or three African students and I was quite friendly with them. However, I had imbibed this from God knows from where this notion that Africans weren't that smart. Then in the mid 50s I saw a fantastic film that some Africans had made. It was a wonderful film. And I somehow told myself they couldn't the some some other person some white man or some other person must have written this script. And then I heard the man who had written the script and he made a short speech. And it was such a brilliant talk. and i felt absolutely ashamed of the prejudice that i had imbibed but there was a prejudice and something had to happen that enabled me to recognize my prejudice so these yeah. tiny incidents as you say i'm mentioning a few of them which have helped me along the way you know thank you for sharing that one you know just to kind of build on that one of the things that's been playing on my mind um in recent times is also this notion that um yes we want to expunge you know any of these very are distorted confining beliefs you know about how you know certain races in a sense are more you know smarter than others or what have you um and then i would also offer that if the way we do that is by seeking to demonstrate the uh presence of smartness in every race then we also run the risk that we are still giving a lot of primacy to smart being better than not smart <laughs> so to say that, that there is something what at one level i respect that you know the higher iq is a better thing and you know all of us have striven to pursue that in academic and other but i'm also you know drawn to this notion of um and i you know i say this to test it with you rajma ji you're such a deep thinker to this notion of you know if you want to call it multiple intelligences sometimes there are people in you know in, in life who bring forth such profound presence sweetness comfort impact 
without necessarily being, in a sense, intellectually the most advanced in the room? Of course, my God, yes. I mean, this is, to me, uh, a person's willingness, ability to think of others, to let others occupy their minds and hearts is far more important than alleged IQs, alleged smartness. Am I living for myself? Am, am I thinking about myself? Or, or do others enter my mental world, my emotional world? Of course, what you say is absolutely true. It's IQ may, may be important, alleged smartness. So when I related that story, it wasn't so much about smartness. It was a story about prejudice. What you say is so true, my goodness. I mean, Rajmanji, on that front, you and I might have this conversation and, you know, somebody listening to us might say, like, hey, you know, fine, you're, you're in a feel-good kind of moment. Mm -hmm. But you've been there in the, you know, in the milieu of life and politics and social struggles and, you know, mediation, you know, both in India but also beyond. And uh, to that end, this idea that we are just exploring about the importance of the quality of the heart, the quality of human connection, of letting other people be part of your consciousness, their pains, their struggles, and their triumphs. Have you actually witnessed how these qualities um, really have a strong impact in the level of success a leader is able to manifest? Or ultimately, in you know, in, again, this messy political world is is um, a lot of success really ultimately coming to just these, you know, tactics and strategies and the more intellectual kind of engagement, you know, with issues. So let me first of all say that the word leadership and the word success, you know, these are not my favorite words. <laughs> but that's just another another prejudice that I may be nursing in my mind. But I, I know what you're getting at, and. Uh, of course, in my long experience uh, in India and many other parts of the world has told me that people with care, with compassion, have a genuine interest in others, are certainly far, far, far more effective in whatever they're doing. This may be the moment where I should mention what I wanted to mention early on, is this place in Western India that along with some wonderful friends and colleagues, I had the privilege of creating in the mid 1960s it's still there panchkeni not far from pune beautiful hill town and our center is called asia plateau because we wanted it to be not just indian we wanted it to be asian we want it to be for the whole world actually uh, it's a it's a beautiful spot it's also environmentally rather attractive and this is a, a space uh, where um, dialogues and conversations for reconciliation, for mutual understanding, for partnership, for healing take place. And the training sessions also take place. And uh, of course, I'm now no longer very active there. But whenever I'm in India, I do support some wonderful colleagues who run this place. But I would uh, want all your listeners and you yourself to be aware of this place forever in that region. Uh, you would find that this Asia Plateau Center of Initiatives of Change will hearten you. Thank you for sharing that. That is so beautiful and uh, amazing to see that you've had this for the last so many decades. Um, you know, I'd love to visit. Um, we actually have a team in Pune for my institute, so I do need to get there now and then. And so, you know, so I'd, I'd love to look forward to that place. And what we'll do with this podcast is share a link or something. Do they have a website? You know, can we yes, share that? Website. Yeah, yeah. Either initiative, initiatives of change or Asia Plateau. And what is the kind of like activity that is happening at that at that institute? Some events are organized by the center. Uh, at other times, the place is given as a location, as a venue for similar like-minded groups to hold their workshops or sessions or conferences. So, so sometimes dialogues take place between uh, different groups uh, that have had a history of uh, misunderstanding or even hostility. It takes effort to, to bring people from both sides. But this has happened over, over the decades and quite usefully too, especially mm -hmm. in the northeastern part of India where we have so many different 
ethnic groups that are in conflict. And then there is also some very uh, effective work there for women's empowerment and for involving the villages in the area. A number of them uh, have been given training here and they ha in, in the center. And they have gone on to produce some remarkable changes in their villages. So there's some impact of, of this, you know, the idea of taking time out to listen to the to the inner voice. Shant Samay, a quiet time, listening to the conscience, listening to the inner voice. So this notion has been embraced by people in many of the villages nearby. Noticeable results. It's very nice to hear that from you. Um, incidentally, you know, I teach at the business school at you know Columbia University. One of the experiments that is bearing some rich fruit over the last year with um, executive MBAs. You know, these are 30 to 45 year olds, as well as as well as with some executives that we've trained at our institute. Is that, you know, I've I've just um, you know given them a method through which to, in the midst of their busy everyday careers and lives take pause for about 10 minutes prior to a critical meeting. You know, this could be with the board or somebody they're negotiating with or the team they're having some trouble with. And, and in those 10 minutes, you know, seek to shift their emotional and mental states to a place of positivity, respect, openness, maybe strategize a couple of ways in which they will go into the conversation and infuse some, you know, some purpose or wisdom or love or something, you know, some positive energy into the conversation just focusing on the human side of the equation rather than the you know the uh, data and the you know the logic and the market and you know all of the business issues that come up it's been really so life affirming humanity affirming to see how after collecting this data with the hundreds of these interactions these individuals have taken on with with that pause in the beginning how they've come back and reported how they were just so pleasantly surprised with how much more reassurance and poise and confidence and uh, you know openness and adaptability they had but also how the other party unexpectedly responded with more conciliation and more just collaboration and connection that they had anticipated would ever be possible and uh, you know so it's you know i'm thinking what your again just the words which are so resonant with me from the whole conversation we have the return to the soul practice of gandhi ji sounds like that's what you're putting in play you know, at, at that institute and perhaps in a small way, you know, these executives are also stumbling into the realization that we, we all have that capacity in us if we just open ourselves up to the right intention and even even just create a few minutes of recentering. So, and, and the core of that recentering in this experiment that you describe is a time of silence also, some quiet, quiet and listening. And uh, my experience over my longish, longish life that listening to other people and listening to your soul or to the inner voice, those are terribly helpful. If you had to recommend one practice that can help us, you know, we've done some reflection, you and I, on, you know, the evolving conditions in India. But really, if you look anywhere across the world today, there is just so much of a state of ferment and you know, change and uncertainty and uh, a desire to want to create a better future than, than where the world is today. So, so really, I think it applies to any of our listeners in any part of the world. But, you know, is that the practice that you would recommend to them in today's time, the discipline of outer and inner listening? Yes, I would. And then obedience to the thought that comes. I've never heard of this idea, but it's such a beautiful, powerful idea. Obedience to the thought that comes. What motivates you to highlight that? You know, what is it that you've seen in terms of frailties of human nature that make that an important precept? You know, very often when we listen in silence after some altercation or some anger or passion or whatever, thoughts may come to us to meet somebody from the other side or it could be to express regret that you had said something that you need not have said. These are just small examples, but or more than that, or in addition to that, it could be also to speak out when nobody else is speaking, when there is uh, fear and in the atmosphere. I seek your permission to again return to the point I had earlier made. When we are injured, you mentioned your family, they suffer during partition. 
I hope they, their lives were spared. You know, those injuries are very real. And one can understand the unhappiness of people of any background who harbor for some time memory or even unhappiness or even anger at horrible things done to them or to their family. But today what is happening in many parts of the world is tremendous anger felt at certain groups when there is no personal injury faced either by the person concerned or their family. That there is this very deep sense that there is some kind of enemy out there or some horrible group out there that is so bad that it should not be given equal rights. Whether it is Afghanistan, whether it is Iran, whether it is Turkey, whether it is Hungary, whether it is India, whether it is Brazil, whether it's United States. So it is this very strong feeling, a negative feeling about some people without any personal injury experienced. So this is something I want scholars like you, gifted men like you, to give thought to. How this thing can be defeated in the world because yeah. it is a very sad reality today. Yeah. You know, what's, what's really clear to me is um, that what you are sharing is a fairly universal, like, undercurrent, you know, to society today, to the tension points today. Yeah. What's also clear to me is that um, in some of those fierce, you know, conflicts, sometimes just within, you know, within a nation, within a society, you know, if you look at the two polarized sides, you know, you, you cry for them, you cry for them because everyone is gravitating towards a certain monolithic view without opening themselves up to, like you said, listening, learning, building relationships with, and uh, discovering a much more nuanced and textured understanding of, of life in the world. And, and therefore, the point you're making just about becoming better listeners, both on the outer and on the inner, I think um, the notion of sort of taking those moments of, of pause to uh, calm oneself, get to as close to the center of one's being becomes so important. I, I remember something I've, I may be paraphrasing him not very well, but something from, you know, Gandhiji's writing, your grandfather's writings about how he says like, you know, the most important thing is for, you know, everybody to follow their truth, you know, to, to follow their truth and to be open to learning and listening along the way if they discover that the path that they've been following is actually flawed in some ways and then to adjusting their approach and and I have confidence that, you know, if you followed your path and I followed my path and we kept adjusting, that we'll kind of like end up in a, in a good place, we'll kind of end up in a good place. What's happening right now is that a lot of that adjusting is not happening, that inner kind of recalibration is not happening. That's absolutely, that's, that's it. But I would just add this, that it is also a trend now in several parts of the world for governments in partnership with sometimes vigilante groups to prevent the expression of ideas. And so what you say is absolutely mm -hmm. true. It is, is, is the most important truth. But when a time comes that intellectuals or others can't even express what they are saying, then it requires not listening, but speaking out. And when speaking out is not possible, at least speaking inside one's own mind that this is not right. Well, you've given us uh, a rich set of precepts and principles that any or all of us can embrace in our own worlds. You know, our issues are not necessarily all the same across the world, across different roles that we are playing in society. But I think the principles that you're sharing could apply to any or all of us. And I, I want to read a couple of quotes from from your work, uh, Raj Munji, because I think they're they're so apropos you know to what we're saying one is you say the choice is not between our god and their god for god is one the choice is between a wind carrying poison and the whisper of the one god intimating his sane counsel to us you know right there you both on the one hand unify you know unify uh, all paths and people to be you know in ultimately you know devotion to the pursuit of truth from that one God, but also imbue that sense of responsibility that um, you have to make the choice within you which which of these two you know ways in which the wind is swaying are you going to be 
shaped by poison in the wind or the whispers of the voice of God. And that's beautiful. The, the other one that comes to my mind is this quote that you, you know, on a more future looking basis share, you say, I do believe that this world was created for a plan and that there is a divinity behind this world. So that gives me faith in a better future. On the other hand, I see how we human beings so often make wrong decisions, angry decisions, impatient decisions, and create problems for ourselves, for others around us, and for future generations. I'm of the view that much of our future is to be built by us. Whether we have a future of justice and dignity or its opposite depends on how all of us, millions of us, are going to decide along the way when the choices come before us. So true. And so in closing, um, Mr. Gandhi, at this stage of your very luminous life, one where you have not just done justice to, but really, you know, in so many ways, advanced uh, significantly the work of uh, your own very luminous grandfathers. Where do you see your greatest sort of quest in the years ahead? What is the one virtue that you'd like to perhaps most seek to manifest in, in humanity and in the circles of influence you have? Well, I can speak from what I want to cultivate in my own life. I, I would like, you know, thoughts of anxiety and worry not to preoccupy my mind. I would like my mind to be free uh, to focus on the really important things, to identify the good things that happen every day. And despite signs of sad things happening, horrible things happening, to maintain my faith that things will improve in both the countries to which I feel connected, India and the United States, and in the world as a whole. Yeah, I can see how much care and thought and you know, heart you've put into responding to that question. So I'm very grateful for that uh, on behalf of all of us. And it's such a powerful testament to your humility that here it is, I was inviting and asking you for a prescription for us and instead you anchored it in a quest for your own self. So Mr. Gandhi, thank you so much for you know our time together. This has been incredibly revelatory and personally very inspiring for me. Deeply honored to have you in our midst and uh, on behalf of all our listeners and my team, just want to wish you all the best in your journey forward. Thank you for all that you've done in, in years past and continue to today. Your work is so important, especially at a time like this in the world, and we're all very grateful. Thank you. Many thanks. I've appreciated this time.